Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, who in the room thinks that all the good sites are gone, and um, even the ones that are out there are too expensive? Yeah, that's it. Well, that's, that's typically what we hear from our guys, uh, our, our clients, when we speak to them. When people come to us, they're it's looking for a coffee shop, uh, looking for somewhere to, to open. Uh, that's typically what we hear first off, uh, is that, you know, where, where can I open? Where, where is the best place? How, how can I really afford it? Should I take this little site here? Or, you know, those are the lot of questions that go around, I think, in, in lots of people's heads. Let me just quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrew, Andrew Bowen. I am uh, the author of the uh, Daily Grind with my wife, Claire, sat in the front row there. And we are independent coffee shop experts. Uh, we work with uh, coffee shops, independent coffee shops all over the world to uh, open, to expand, improve profitability, and eventually to sell. Uh, and we also run the uh, coffee shop boot camp, um, which is a two day intensive course. In, uh, and we just did one a couple of weeks ago in um, San Remo's cool facilities in Hackney in London. So, um, so that's me. Anyway, so first question um, What is the number one reason people go to a coffee shop? Now, it's not a trick question because the answer is in the title. It is a convenient location. So, for the last uh, 15 years, or however long Allegra have been doing their research, um, that is always the number one reason people say they visit a coffee shop. It's because it's in a convenient location. People are typically quite lazy. Um, they won't walk far for a cup of coffee, um, particularly if you're time pressed, particularly if you're um, on your lunch break or on the way to work or something, you know, or I'm actually do I really want next 100 jars. It, it needs to be absolutely special. It needs to be something like a, a Maxwell Club Dashwood type of coffee for it to become a destination site. Most coffee shops, most independent coffee shops, uh, the number one reason people visit there is, is because of its uh, location. And the big chains spend millions and millions and millions of pounds. And they've got massive teams of people looking at data, looking at, you know, demographics, uh, using all their sort of experience and knowledge and of trading and it's something that an independent really just hasn't got uh, that sort of level number one that the, the amount of money you spend to get special thing to, to choose a, a site um, or even the time and the energy often you know cost will spend more choosing a site than uh, the average independent would have in their whole budget to um, to open it so you know it, it's one of those things it's a bit of a dark art the way people have used coffee, used coffee shops now has changed over the last 20 years since we've been involved, or 15 years since we've been involved in coffee. coffee if you opened a coffee shop anywhere 15 years ago, um, you would be full because the, the lure of really good coffee, uh, the lure of that caffeine fix in the morning was so great, and you couldn't get it else. You couldn't get it elsewhere. It was before pods. It was before the the uh, Costa Express um, that are opening everywhere. It's before the garage sold some coffee. If you remember what coffee used to be, takeaway coffee it used to be that sort of plastic cup that was so hot. Uh, that you, you know, you scald yourself with it. And the, the question was, you know, would you want milk and sugar? That, that was your limitation. So to get really good coffee 15 years ago was was difficult, but now it's everywhere. So the role of the coffee shop has changed. So when you're considering uh, your what, where, where to open, what to open, you understand what the, the mission almost of your coffee shop is going to be, because takeaway coffee is, you know, from coffee shops is really reduced. Um, we've seen probably a 50 to 70 percent reduction in takeaways across the industry because of the availability of coffee. You know, you get in the morning, and before you get to the end of the road, there's a Costa Express. You know, and then you get to the garage, there's a Costa Express. You go to the station, there's a Nero kiosk. You get to your office, there's somewhere in the outside on a on a Piaggio machine, and then you get in the office of the coffee machine. So you can get coffee everywhere. So you've got to be really special. So the role of the coffee shop has has changed. And if you if you if you read uh, Ray Oldenburg's book uh, The Great Good Place, he describes the third place, which he describes that before um, cost, uh, Starbucks uh, started using it. So it's that third place where people go. It's not home. It's not work. It's a place of community. I think that's where the independent coffee shops are really really the ones that are doing really well at the moment. Those are the ones that have made managed to create that sense of community. Uh, for their location. And of course, pubs are closing at a, a, a massive rate. 
So, um, you know, for every pub that shuts, there's an opportunity for a coffee shop to open. So, that, you know, there's still loads and loads of opportunity out there for to open uh, independent coffee shops. It's just getting the right location, which is what we're talking about today. So, what makes me an expert on this? Well, a little bit of history. Um, for a vast proportion of my career, I worked at Tesco. And um, for a, a large proportion, I worked for a little, little division called Express. Um, when I joined Express, there was 23 sites, I think. Uh, when I left there, there was a thousand. And now, you know, there's many tens of thousands almost. They are everywhere. But And then when I moved over to um, Coffee 15 years ago, I, I, I could see, I, I was able to smell out when a good Tesco Express was going to be a success or not, just, just by having the looking at different sides of the road or looking at the traffic flows and all that sort of stuff. So it was, I, I was able to transport, transpose that into, um, into, a, into a way of finding good sites for our, for our coffee shop business when we started developing it. And then when we wrote the book, well, we thought we'd actually put that down on paper. So in fact, the first, uh, second chapter of the book, and the biggest chapter actually, is all about location because it is so so important. There is another one reason. You get your convenient location right, then you know you're you're halfway there. Stop. Before you start looking for a site, you need to do something important. You need to under, you need to spend a fair bit of time becoming crystal clear with your vision for your coffee shop. You need to understand what your mission is almost. You know, what, what you're going to deliver, what style of coffee shop is, is it going to get a community coffee shop? Is it going to get a specialty high end coffee shop? Uh, are you going to be vegan? Are you going to be vegetarian? Are you going to be, you know, Caribbean? Whatever. You know, you just need to be really crystal clear on that first. You know, before you sign up for the website, before you register with the, um, with the agents, before you spend time wasting your time, uh, you know, going up down the high street looking for places, you need to be really crystal clear. Because once you've got that clarity, you can then, you know, you then that informs your site. So it informs the shape, it sort of informs the size, it informs how big your kitchen's going to be because you'll know what your menu's going to look like. And a little formal inform where you can put it. After all, you wouldn't open, you know, a vegan restaurant at the back of a butcher shop. Yeah. And so many people think about actually don't actually. They find a site, and in the back of their head, they've got their vision, but the two things aren't congruent. And suddenly, you've got this, you might have the best business. You know, it might be the best coffee for a million miles. It might be the best in your town. But if you're, if you ain't got customers that fit your avatar, you know, those, those potential customers that you want to serve, if they're not walking past your door, remember I said most, most of the, um, most people who want coffee are a bit lazy. They won't go very far unless you, unless you generate a, uh, a destination. Site. So you need to be really crystal clear on that. On the next slide, I've, I've, I've sort of identified six different uh, general places where you where we open. Well, I haven't included on here actually um, the uh, drive-through coffee shops because typically an independent coffee shop uh, owner won't have the finances or the ability to open a, a uh, drive-through. You know, if you can, then great. And some of these cost drive-throughs three, four, three, four million quid. A year, so you know it, they are really, really profitable. Um, but in, in terms of the infrastructure, it's not typically where our clients or where our people that come to us asking for help uh, want to open. And also, I've got, the, I've got the blue and the green. So just to, for clarity, that the green is the, the is the marketing cost you need to build into your business. So for obvious reasons, if you open um, if you open the high street, you don't really need an awful lot of marketing costs because your marketing cost is just is just the uh, occupation cost because you've got all these thousands of people walking past your front door. And as long as you get your curb appeal right, as long as you get your sign right, so as long as you get uh, the you know the, the the right look as you look through the window and people know it's a coffee shop and know what they're know what you're going to get when you walk in, you will get people coming coming through your door almost without spending any money on marketing. And marketing, by the way, is not just, you know, leaflets or vouchers or Facebook advertising or, you know, uh, or giving away um, free coffee and tasters. It's a, it's a combination of all of those things. You know, you will need to spend some money on, on, on that market. But if, you open a, if you're in a high street or a shopping centre where you've got that passing trade automatic, you don't really need to consider um, spending that much on that. If you're slightly off-piste, which um, what I mean by that is 
just around the corner, just down the, down the, down the side streets, not quite on the main drag, but not miles away. You know, where you can, if you have a good offer, and often these sites are slightly off piece, you can get much bigger units for the same price. They are more flexible. So you're able to, uh, if you get a, you get a you're typically a, a court, like, you know, a, on a high street, the, the, the average price per square foot of rental is quite high. Whereas off, off piece, you can get a much cheaper unit, you can get a much bigger, and if you've got bigger, you can do more things with it. Uh, you have events, you can meeting rooms, you can, you know, hold classes, all that sort of stuff, and help it become a bit more security. But you will need in the beginning, and these green green marks are there really, and green, the green is there for the beginning of your journey. I think when once you've got an established business, you, the amount you need to spend on, on marketing will reduce over time. But a lot of people go into a business and they'll spend all their money on the fit They'll spend all their money on the on the rent and end up with nothing. And then when they they and, and often in our business, word of mouth our, our advertising is a is a badge of honour. You know, well, I don't need to advertise because my coffee's so good, my business is so good. I do so much of this coffee, this oh yes, I've got the best machine. But actually, you know. 99% of people out there just want, and they don't go there for your coffee, they go there because there's something else, it's part of the community, they go there, you know, most people, well, no, um, there's a statistic that says that people can only go to 25 places in their life, you can only visit 25 places at one time, so you, if you've got, in, in your routine, you know, your coffee shop needs to become one of those 25 places, okay, and they won't go to, won't go to many, they can't, the brain can't cope with it, so you need to, you need to give them a real good reason to visit it. The next one then is a transport hub, which again, there isn't much advertising in there or marketing, purely because, you know, you're limited, you've got that great footfall traffic going past. The issue with the transport hub, of course, is that, um, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute about footfall, is that um, you might have great big peaks and troughs of trade. And you've got to remember, even if you've got 10,000 people a minute walking past the front of your coffee cart or coffee unit, you can only serve so many per hour. And you get that maximum availability. Um, so when you're looking at, you know, looking at perspective of a unit, they might say, well, you know, football is, you know, a thousand a day or ten thousand a day or whatever. But just remember in your head, you probably only serve sixty an hour if you've got one machine. And people will only typically um, queue for six. So any more than six people in queue in front of them, they typically will. It reduces the uh, the likelihood of somebody joining that queue. So once you've got more than six in the queue, people then don't, don't like to join. So it's self-limiting your sales. Then it's really busy. The next one is in somebody else's business. So like a, a garden centre or a bike shop or a um, state home or a park, somewhere like that, or, or even a department store, somewhere that you can um, partner with the, the other business. And again, that's a really good way to start. Because you know you've already got past the traffic, you've already got an established trade. They might, you know, they might want you to add value to their business, put a, put a much better coffee operation. They might have an existing restaurant that's pretty mediocre that people don't visit. Um, and by bringing something with passion and with energy, you can up, up the whole game of the overall business. You know, there's some great examples of of, um, of uh, coffee shops in. in in uh, bike shops, for instance, you know, Mud Dog in Bristol is, is renamed for that. So it's a restaurant now above a bike shop, and it all really works really well together. Off grid, so this is where you need to spend the most money on um, on marketing, although your 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 costs are going to be quite low to start off with. But this is the you know the industrial estate. This is the sort of back of the on. This is like you know big unit, perhaps not not people aren't used to go in there. Uh, it might be you know in the, in the middle of nowhere. But that's that's where you need to be, you need to spend your money on marketing in terms of becoming a destination, giving people reasons to go there. You know, like a farm shop. If you were to open up in a farm somewhere in the middle of nowhere, um, and start doing great ice creams. There's a peak, there's guys are in by us that have done the same thing. They're renowned for their ice cream, and they've got a great cafe business there. So the, I put cars or mobile there because um, people want, often will come to say, "Well, I'll start cart." You know, it's a low barrier to enter. Get this, you can buy one off eBay, buy a machine, or whatever. But fundamentally, the, the next question is where you're going to put it, because you know you just can't turn up these carts anywhere. Sometimes, you know, you, all, a lot of the again, it's a site. A lot of the good sites are gone. You need to um, get permissions. Where are you going to store the cart at night? Where's it going to go? You know, uh, what are you going to do when it's freezing cold? Uh, how are you going to stop the, the water from freezing? All that sort of stuff. So some of these romantic ideas of starting the cart are great. 
ultimately you end up with a um, a job rather than a business. You know, it's difficult to scale. The key the key points now are things that we so when we look at the site when when we go through our uh, analysis of a site with our with our clients or if you come to us, we'll 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 ask them about competition. You know, it is sometimes competition is good. And sometimes it's not so good. But you need to understand that you know so having competition there is not always a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing. You know, if you are the first mover in a high street and you and you find this little town, and there are not many left now, but if you find this little high street in 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 the UK without a coffee shop in, and you can open there. You'll make a success of that, but you can guarantee in you know your 18 months time, somebody's going to see you doing well, and they're going to open next door to you. And of course, when they do that, um, that's your biggest hit as a business. So you open a brand, a brand new coffee shop that does really, really well. Then all your metrics are um, sort of improved because you've got no competition. But then when you've got somebody else, suddenly you end up paying a little bit more in rent, you pay a little bit more in wages, and your business doesn't it gets a bit flabby because you're making some money. And then somebody open next door to you, and then suddenly you know you've lost potentially 50% of your business. So sometimes uh, opening a coffee shop when there is an existing row of businesses is not a bad thing, um, particularly if you uh, build a complementary business, not a cannibalistic business. So if you're going to go there and just copy, you know, the guy next door, he's got a queue out this door because he does he does he does crepes and he does milkshakes, and if you open next door and do the same thing, then really that's a bit pointless, and that happens an awful lot. Um, the Me Too, as they come along, and they, you know they'll do the same thing that, that, that without any, you know, they haven't really quite worked out. They thought it was a great site, but he's doing well. I'll just copy what he does. And if you, that's not the way to do it, you need to be, you need to open someone that's complementary, so you offer something different, so that because often if if there's a high street, a parade of coffee shops or takeaways or restaurants, people are in the habit of going there, so they'll be in the habit of coming to you, and and you get to a point I think there there is a point when it's over saturation. Or I think there is a there is a point there is a point of three or four, you know, coffee shops or cafes in an area um, where it is it does work does work quite well. And of course, the other thing to think about is whether it's an independent area or a corporate area. So if you're going to open, um, you know, if your if your if your business is going to be very independent looking and feeling, um, it might look out of place if it's a street full of you know corporate. Top shops or a high street or something like that. You want to, you know, you need to think: Is it congruent? Uh, are you going to, you know, are you going to, are, are you able to compete? Are, are the people that walk in past ex- going to expect to see you there, or are they more likely to see you in a row of, of uh, you know, quirky secondhand shops or something like that? So think about the the type of competition as well. It's not just you know, is there competition. The next one is footfall. So again, you've got different types of footfall. You've got good footfall and bad footfall. Um, if you've got thousands of people walk, and you've got these peaks and troughs I talked about in Transport Hub. So you've got a Transport Hub with um, thousands of people walking past. You know, for example, uh, in Marleybone to Baker Street Station, thousands of people walking down that road every day. But they're all dedicated to one thing, and that's catching the train or catching the tube, get to work. So, you know, you, that's not necessarily 10,000 people walking past your front door an hour is particularly necessarily a good thing. So you need to understand uh, footfall, the sort of, the mentality of the people that walk past your business. What is their what is their sort of aim in the day? You know, are you, are they able to build you in to their day? Um, and of course, you know, I've already alluded to the fact that you know, there is a limit to how many customers you can serve uh, in an hour. If you look at Pret, Pret are a great example of having you know seven or eight tills, banker tills with seven or eight different coffee shop uh, coffee machines at the back there. So you know, you can walk in. Where everyone's there, everyone's there lunch at half past 12, but everyone goes to Pret. Um, but because they got eight machines, you can go in and come out and quickly. Independent coffee shop, you generally can't do that because you ain't, you know, you're not going to be able to spend all that money on uh, on seven or eight coffee machines just for that one hour. It's a different business model. So just because there's thousands of people walk past the door, not necessarily um, all good. Cost is the next thing to look for. So in terms of cost, how much you do you spend on a uh, on a rent on rents and rates, well, ideally you don't even be spending more than 10% of, uh, of of your sales on rent and rates. Now in London, I know it's really difficult, um, but you know even even in predictions, you should be looking at 
level and edge up to uh, 10%. If you, if you achieve 10% rental and rates, then you'll have a good business. If you if you take over a business that's you know, potentially a 20% rental rates, which we see so often, you'll never make any money out of it. You know that it's you know you can't make you know more than 80% margin um, out of this business, even if you've got all takeaway coffee. So you know you've got staff costs you've got up all the time. Uh, electricity costs, you know, just, you know, even in a small coffee shop, electricity shop, uh, power can be eight or nine grand a year. So there's all these things that perhaps surprise you when you're actually down to I think break as well. You need to make enough money to give yourself a lifestyle, you need to also make enough money to uh, refit as well in three years' time when it gets wrecked, because your shop will get wrecked. If you're busy, uh, it will get wrecked. People come in and they ruin it, they'll break the toilet, they'll break this, they'll break that, the chairs will break, the sales will get scratched. And suddenly you'll look tatty. And one of the downfalls a lot of the uh, independents we see is that they look great on opening day, but three years down the line they haven't quite made enough money. They're just about surviving, and they haven't made enough money to sort of do enough to make it keep it fresh. And when you when you look at you know lessons of the of the big chains, they do that very very regularly. You know, uh, they they refit every every three to five years. And without it, they know scientifically if they don't do that, then their trade goes down. So you need to build that into your model. And the other thing on costs is hidden costs as well. So often um, you'll sign a lease, and I'll go on to leases in a minute. Often you'll sign a lease and you won't read the small print. You'll think it's all, you know, all okay. A bit like a domestic, taking a take the lease out of a house or a flat, um, getting about the hidden costs. So you know we got hit with a hidden cost in one of our branches of 25 grand because three stores stories above, um, the gutter needs replacing and painting. So it was a big building. Uh, so they had to spend a load of money on on uh, scaffolding, and in our lease it said we were, we were liable 50% of the renovation costs. So suddenly, you know, that's a hidden cost that wasn't in our business model anyway. So those, those sort of things you need to be really aware of. Obviously, they can really stop hit you sick, really, and uh, you know, stop you going on holiday, stop you buying a new car, stop you actually eating. The next one is the building. So. Um, Another another thing we see is that people will, will find a building that's already great news. I've got this site that is uh, already fitted out as a coffee shop or a cafe, and um, it's really good. And the landlord's happy to let me have it for uh, not much money. Um, and um, yeah, good. But trying to work out why that previous business has failed because there's going to be a reason. And if you, but if you ask the landlord or People involved, it always be family issues or something. It's nothing. Nothing about the rubbish business or the rubbish location. It'll all be something. It all be fudged. So you never get the truth on that. So just be aware of that as a bit. But fundamentally, if you're going to take over a shell, there are some massive costs that you need to think about. So if you take over, a, you know, you need a, a good floor. You know, probably ten grand. You need ceiling. You need plumbing. And chances are, the plumbing will be at the back of the shop. You'll want the plumbing at the front because you don't want the old counters at the back. Is in all retail units, you take them over new, they're all the full sort of back corner. Power's probably not enough because you know it's a retail unit, so all they want is lights. But they, you know, if you're going to use this coffee shop, you want ovens, you want you know, your coffee machine, uh, you know, your refrigeration, your dishwasher, all those sort of things. So, chances are you might take it over and the um, the power board needs upgrading, or worst case scenario, you need to get more power in the building. So, those are some sort of things we consider. If you get those, you know, if you can find a unit that has a lot of those things already in, they've been reused, then that, that is really good. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be an existing cafe or coffee shop. So if you've got a unit that's got a really good floor that you can use or a ceiling that you can use and the plumbing in the right place, that will save a load of money. Um, and it's about understanding those opportunities when you're looking. This is all about identifying, looking, looking at different different units when you're sort of thinking about opening and trying to identify which one is which one is better. You know which one is which one is the one I would choose, and this what we, this is what we uh, see what we go through when we, when we talk to our clients. Another thing is parking. So uh, you know it goes without saying really, if, if you've got loads of parking outside, you're going to be busy. And uh, if you've got on-street parking, it's great. If people there's a car park outside your door that they're going to walk, they'll be able to get to. Great. And also if there's a pay to stay car park or a pay on exit car park. You know if you've got a pay on exit car park, that's better. Because you're not worried about, do I need to get back to my car? Because I've only got two hours on it. I've only paid for two hours. So I haven't got time for a coffee. Or I haven't got time for that extra sandwich. So little nuances like that can make a, make a difference. Orientation. 
Are you on the sunny side of the street or the shady side of the street? Everything looks better in the sun. So if you've got two units, one's in the shade, one's in the sun, then you know which one fills up first. Just you know, if you go on a holiday, then one of these market, one of these great big squares in Venice or you know, Prague or Hungary. You know, where do you go in the morning? Yeah, you go to the one, and the one that's always fullest is the one in the sun. Oh, we've got to sit in the shade. So it's the same with a coffee shop. Uh, people will prefer to sit. You know, it, it looks nicer in the sun. Um, yeah, this year is probably the only year in living memory in this country that we would um, that it would probably be quite nice for a bit of shape. But for the rest of the, the rest of the time, it's always it's always the same. It's a big so that, again, landlords don't generally when they're pricing a unit up when in terms of rent per square foot, they don't generally consider is it sunny, is it shady, because you know they're thinking about renting a unit, they're not thinking about you know they're not thinking the opportunity. So. There's sometimes, you know, if you've got two, two in the one in the sun, one in the shade, then go for one in the sun. Aligned with that is the outside space. So, you know, with the smoking ban now, having outside space is, is, is really beneficial. So if you can have good outside space, it makes a heck of a difference. A continent way of sitting outside in the market, in the market square now is, is, is in, entrenched really in our, in our psyche. You know, 10 years ago, people wouldn't sit outside, but now people will sit outside in all winds and weathers. Now, particularly if you've got a, a smoker in the group, now I'll sit outside and it's minus 20, you know. So, but having, again, having outside space available in the sun, uh, where it's not too windy, will be perfect with a few canopy. The cost of putting stuff outside is often a lot cheaper than, you know, the, the, the unit inside. So the price per, per square foot of outside space is often less. And sometimes, um, you might have in your original lease, you might have, you know, you might have a demise outside where you're able to put um, seats without paying anything to the council or the local authority. Um, you know, if you're in central London, yeah, I know it might cost you a thousand pounds a year to put a table out. So you need to understand that. There's no point in thinking, well, I can put 20 tables out there and then, but not approach in the local authority to find out is that, am I able to do that? Because there's sometimes there's some very strict uh, rules around that. And often, you know, from our own experience, where we try to put, take, we'll put um, tables and chairs outside, uh, it's down to the fire service, it's down to the police, it's down to the local authority, it's down to the highways people because, you know, access, all that sort of stuff. We, I tried four times to try and get seats out of our shop in Oxford and, um, you know, couldn't because, you know, even when they wanted the pay much, well, now they wanted the pay much and get a couple of seats, but no, no way. So, you know, you might think it's a good idea, there's an opportunity, but you need to check with the relevant authority before you sign up. And again, you know, if you get a, if you get a unit with outside space, or well, without outside space, then obviously the one with outside space should, should, um, should be the one you go for. The next one is barriers. So what I mean by barriers is, you know, some physical barriers to entry. So it, it might be a pelican crossing, you know, it might be a really busy road, it might be physically um, pedestrian barriers now, that you can't actually cross the road, it's too busy a road. So you might, you know, you might see nice, your know, nice coffee shop across the road in the sun, but everybody's walking on this side of the road. You know, well, I mean, do I really want to stand in front of the Pelican Crossing wait for the change before I go across the road, get my coffee, then come over and do that with it? So it's not, is it? People are generally lazy, so you need to consider that. You know, is are you able? Uh, are, are, is there an underpass? You know, people are like, well, under underpass. Like that. So just be aware of that in when you when you when you compare in sight with sight. The last but one is the least. Now, I could probably do a whole, well, two days of that, in truth. As I've already said, the, you know, a commercial lease is a completely different beast to a uh, signing up a lease on a house or a flat. Okay, there's completely different rules of plot. When you sign a commercial lease, you're not signing, you know, just, I can like leave in three months. You're basically signing that lease for the term of the lease. So if you, if you spend, if it's a 50,000 pound year lease, and it's ten and it's, it's for ten years, fifty thousand pounds for ten years. Then you are effectively committing to pay that landlord to half a million quid, and there's no way out of it. So you need to be really, really clear on that. And taking advice, legal advice on sorting your lease out is, is the most, is the best money you will ever spend. Okay, because leases, commercial leases, are designed uh, to protect the landlord. They're not designed for you. They're designed for the landlord, purely and simply. And they're, sometimes some of these landlords use really expensive solicitors and they make sure there's lots and lots of pages, which 
if you take it to your sister, you're just going to say, well, that's going to cost a lot of money to go to all that because it's m and worth every penny. Because within that lease, there'll be something that says, you know, I've got you, or you can't, you know, you can't get out all your house on your personal guarantee or something that's going to catch you out. So you need to, you need to understand the impact of the lease. You know, if you can, you know, a landlord uh, will want to have the longest possible lease for the most amount per year. That's what they want. And what you want is obviously the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to find something in the middle. Um, and getting, uh, you know, building in break clauses, um, at perhaps one year or five years. Um, but more importantly, uh, being inside the tech landlord and tenant act. Now. A lot of landlords will ask you to sign a bit of paper that says, "Well, you know, like you're not, you're not uh, included inside the landlord and tenant act." And what that means is that you have no automatic right of renewal of your lease when it comes to the end. Okay, so you haven't got a business to sell. So you spent 10 years building this fantastic coffee shop business. Um, and when you got to sell it, you know the people that's going to buy it off you. So, well, you know, what am I buying? Oh. I've got a year to run my lease. Okay, but well what then? Well, there is nothing. So you, you effectively are not ensuring that you are inside the land and tenant act. Um, you are putting, you basically have more business. Um, but obviously the landlord will love you not to get there because they, if you've got a successful business, you are having value to their business, uh, to their property. At the end of it, they could just kick you out and get somebody else in. That's going to pay a bit more, perhaps one of the bigger, bigger chains. So being inside the landlord tenant that is, is, you go away with nothing from today, then just make sure you, you are inside the landlord tenant act. The other things to consider is, to, is being able to reassign the lease as well. So um, you, you, within the lease, there'll be a clause that says you can actually sell it on for somebody else without, without having a brand new lease. Think about the shared cost, which I've already talked about, and also dilapidations as well. So dilapidations is at the end of the lease, when you hand it back to the landlord, say you say, well, actually, I'll, you know, I want to go now. Uh, it hasn't been as good as I expected, or I just made, you know, I'm, I'm changing, my, changing my career, and blah, blah, blah. So if you say, yeah, great, no problem, but you need to put it back exactly how it was when we gave it to you. So all that money you spent on refit, all that ceiling, all that flooring, all that equipment, all that plumbing, you technically, they don't very often do it, but they could quite easily say to you, well, I want it back exactly as it was when I took it over. So sometimes that dilapidation clause, uh, and I've seen it happen, where you know the if the exit and tenant has been called back three or four times, and they have to get it repainted and redecorated and repaired, um, and it's, it's cost them a lot more. They haven't included that in their in their consideration. And then the exit. So I've talked a little bit about that exit, but when you're starting off, you think, well, what is my best we at the end? You know, what what can I do with it? You know. Um, is it going to make a, a great coffee shop for my kids to take over from me? Um, is it going to be the beginning of a chain that I'm going to use to um, generate you know, it, investors to come in? Um, or is it just going to be a lifestyle business I'm going to sell in 10 years' time and every time? Um, but on exit, you've got to think, well, what, what can that building be used for at the end? You know, is it, has it got the ability to be something else? Or it's only going to be ever a coffee shop. You know, if it could be a pub or a bar or a restaurant, if it's big enough, um, then potentially you know that it's got more more opportunities. So when you're looking at it, try and imagine, you know, is that unit going to be available to do anything else? One of the things I haven't talked about so in there is it is size as well as size of the unit, um, which is something we see people make a decision wrongly, ill-informed decision around buying a small unit with about 15 to 20 covers um, and those sort of size units are the ones that chew a lot. Those are the sort of units you can never really, unless you want to just be a lifestyle business, unless you're happy to be the person on the machine and working every day, um, you will never be able to generate enough turnover from there unless it's, you know, unless it's in a, a, a travel hub you know, or a kiosk. There is a typical high street, 15, 20 seat coffee shop cafe. Those sort of units will never ever make you in there. You know, it's much better. People have got comfort like you think, well, actually, I want to sign up for a small unit so it's easy to run. It'd be cheaper. But fundamentally, you know, there is a there's a physical limit how many people you can get through the doors. You know, there's a physical limit how many tables you've got there. There's a physical limit to how much money you can take per hour. 
you know, you need to know you break even. So often you break even and it's, it's, you know, almost hard to achieve because, you know, if, if, even if you're really busy, your tables are only be fully off about 50% of the day. Like, I, I, I bet you, I, I don't know whether those, um, we're looking at the picture at the beginning, I just wonder whether, they, it's not a picture of a, um, a mattress, uh, oh, I should have photoshopped that out, it's a mattress in front. This is a picture of, um, of Queensway in London. And then you can see, just to make my point about the sunny side or the shady side of the street, you see where all the, all the people are walking. This is uh, 9 o'clock on a, on a Tuesday morning. And we were walking down there, and I was just like, we were on the way to see somebody. And it just struck me. And it was just, but that's repeated, you know, after, um, you know, everywhere in the world, effectively, people like to walk on the sunny side of the street. I talked about the boot camp. Um, and we are doing a online version of it, uh, which is coming up very shortly. And um, if you want to uh, find out more, you can download this presentation at the uh, URL at the bottom. And, and also, we've got a, um, uh, a Facebook group uh, called Coffee Shop Facebook slash Coffee Shop Starter, which I know some of the guys in the room are actually members of it. But we're growing it. It's only for you if you're in startup mode. There is a little sign up. There's a couple of questions you need to answer before you get in. Um, so we are keeping it really tight just on people who are in that startup mode so the quality information is good. But please go ahead and, and join us on that. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.